Words About Books is a poorly spoken podcast, and this week we are once again talking about Promise of Blood by Brian Sanderson. Oh, so close. (laughs) All right, hold on. Hold on. McClellan? Uh, Okay. Sanderson's the. Oh, you uh, legitimately thought it was Sanderson. Sanderson was uh, Brandon Sanderson. That was the other guy. Okay. Well, I I merged the two in my head. So somewhere out there, a, a thousand fantasy book podcasts cried out in pain, and then were silenced. Good. Good. That leaves us good. alone. Good. We're, we've cornered the market then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, just a brief recap of what we talked about last time. The the manliest man who ever manned a man started a rebellion, murdered the king, put down a counter-rebellion, killed the most general general of all generals in the world, and then also started a war in the span of about 70 minutes of us talking about it. Uh, (laughs) He is not a very good statesman. Also, there's a detective and his cokehead son. How's it going, buddy? I'm I'm Nate, by the way. Well, the, okay, I just want to clarify. The cokehead is the son of the man-man, not the detective. Yes, I could see how the way I said that made it sound like the detective's cokehead son. It's the it's the uh, manly man field marshal's cokehead son. You think they call it powder heads? Like, ah, oh, look at that guy. He's a real powder head, just snorting that I powder. I do not. Th- I th- they called it going powder blind. Yeah, but there's got to be like a like slang a noun? for that. Like someone who is powder blind <laughs> is a blank. Yeah, a powder a powder head. head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, apparently, he's not powder blind yet. I don't think we've ever actually seen someone go powder blind. I think no. we'll get into that in this part. I do get a real kick out of Taniel commenting on how drunk the one guy is, and just just <laughs> not seeing it. <laughs> just a whole lot of not seeing it. I hate Taniel. That's another recap. Taniel's awful. Yeah, Taniel's yeah. a terrible person, and this is another case where I don't know. I don't know if the author would agree with me. Well, let's let's again just real quick, just to throw it out there. It, it's we're not going to get to it until part three. I don't think Capoel uh, is fourteen he, <laughs> until yes. she's not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she's fourteen. She may or may not be a boy. She's she's got like no secondary sexual characteristics, yes. and they have a father daughter relationship. Keep that in yes, mind. Until dear the listener. very second they don't. And she's magically 19. And also, Taniel uh, shaves a few years <laughs> off as well. <laughs> you're, you're really jumping the gun here, but yes. I'm just inserting it as clumsily as the author did. It's okay, because oh, Kapoel is actually a, a 7,000 year old dragon. <laughs> That's the anime excuse, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Oh God! We should probably start. Yeah, let me let me briefly mention we we never mention Adamat's uh, story because it doesn't really matter. He has a run in with a guy named Lord Vitas or whatever who takes over his loan sharking. Vitas is like is that I, his name? Vetus. I would say Vetus or something like that. I don't think it's Vitas right. hitting those vowels extra hard. So yeah, he's he's like hmm. Uh, don't worry. Uh, or he he wants a. Uh, he wants information on his investigation, and when Adamat's like, no, the Lord is like, well, I'll just come back when I have some leverage. I, it's obvious where this is going. I don't know why he didn't immediately think of that. He's not much of a detective. He's no, uh, okay, <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta confess something here. So my, my mom finally suckered me into watching Hercule Poirot, the, the David Suchet ones. I believe it's Poirot. It's not. He's no uh, Hercule Poirot is what I was going to say. He's more of a Hastings. He's a Hastings without a Poirot. It's more more of a JJ or a Valentine. You know. <laughs> Getting a little ahead of yourself here. Hey, I was just following your lead. I didn't go all the way ahead and do another book. <laughs> you should have. It's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> it's short. I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, I finished that and... Two days in between actual working. I wanted to also mention uh, Thomas's counsel. This is 
Thomas's all-star team of what is described as a bunch of bickering children who all hate each other. I was going to say, he didn't choose them because he, he wanted them. He chose them because they were uniquely positioned to stop him. So he had to court them and get them all on his side. Yeah, I also... I wrote down here that most of the people are just, like, uh, tropes, almost. Like, uh, Lord Vettis or whatever. He's, like, the mystery man. A cool mystery guy working for a mystery lord. It does lean pretty heavy on tropes. I don't know that I... I don't know that I count that against the book. There were there were too many mysterious, faceless people. There's a lot of that, yeah. For my liking. There's, there's too much of that. I, like, I want to, I, I guess I'd put it this way. I don't fault the book for leaning on tropes. I think in genre fiction, especially as a young first time author, you're going to lean on tropes because that's what makes it part of the genre in a lot of ways. But some of the clumsy handling of the tropes becomes a problem with the Adamat subplot specifically because Adamat is supposed to be a detective solving a mystery, and I think the mystery is supposed to remain at least a little intriguing. It never became intriguing. The first mystery was intriguing, but like it was very obvious what Krasimir's promise is. Krasimir's promise is a big disappointment. That is one of the things I count against the book, because... I know we're kind of rehashing a point from last episode, but should have been something more. Yeah, for that, I guess maybe I should state that in last episode we found out that Cressamere's promise was: should the king's line ever end and there not be a king in any of these nine kingdoms, then Cressamere will return and exact revenge on behalf of the king. There's also if the king dies then all of his mages are forced and compelled to avenge him. Yes, and that's fine. What's not fine is why that was ever a secret. Yes, like you said, if you were the king, that would be something that was rehearsed in the Pledge of Allegiance and every day at church and on billboards like, hey, remember if you kill me, God will come down and destroy you. I saw this criticism on Twitter that this guy was saying that he feels like most people who are critical of books focus too much on the in, like the logic of the book versus, I don't know, I don't think he, he, this particular guy really thought there was like a valid form of criticism. I think he was kind of trying to deflect criticism. But something he said did stick with me, and that was that he didn't like criticism geared towards... Oh, well, no rational person would do that, or this doesn't make sense. And I think there's there's a certain amount of that we do for fun on the podcast where we talk about um, why, why is Olam so, so darn dedicated to Thomas when he's never met Thomas before and <laughs> right? he doesn't... And he falls in love with Thomas, yeah. basically, and he would die for Thomas. I think that's funny, but I wanted to point out that like that... That is not book breaking for me. I I don't care so much about that. I I don't care that Olam right. acts that way. That he warmed up to Thomas really quickly. I can I can buy that. That's just a quirk of Olam's character. The reason Chrisomir's promise not being shouted from the rooftops bothers me is because it's internally inconsistent. Like we we went out of our way to make sure that that was not just a forgotten piece of lore. It would have been one thing if it had faded into memory or if people had known about this legend, but they no longer believed in it. But instead, it was a mystery. Somebody was actively seeking to hide what Cressamere's promise was, and we needed a detective to figure it out. And the detective didn't figure it out by detecting it, by putting clues together and synthesizing and analyzing information, he did it by just asking a guy who knew, <laughs> who <laughs> was also known to the major players in the book. Like they could have easily just written him a letter and asked him, but they didn't. And all the m- mages of the cabal knew and they didn't tell anyone. That's actually a good point. Thomas could have been like, hey, we need your help to figure out what Cressmere's promise is. Here's a mage in the Cabal who survived. Go talk to him. Yeah, or the mages of the Cabal could have easily just been like, hey, Thomas, don't do this, because if you do, 
Kresimir is going to come back and kill you. It's heavily implied that the general knew what Kresimir's promise was. And the general could have easily said, hey, Thomas, can't help you with this, man, because if we do this, Kresimir is going to come kill us. Yeah, during the negotiations, they should have been, they could have been like, hey, let's put the boy on the throne. He'll be a puppet king. And that way, Kresimir won't come and kill us. Yeah. The fact that this is so central to the plot, and there are so many logical inconsistencies internal to the world. I don't care that there are powder mages. I think the powder mage is a silly concept myself. I think the notion of somebody snorting gunpowder is kind of silly myself. I can go along with it. it the, the book sets the rules. My problem with Kresimir's promise is it's not consistent with the rules the book set for itself. In this book, people tend to behave in a way that benefits them. They use our Earth logic for the most part, except in this one situation where we just needed to have a mystery. That's why Kresimir's Promise bothers me. I don't know if I made that clear enough in the first episode. I don't know if I separated the criticisms I have because we did a lot of like joking about Kresimir's Promise and then switching around and joking about how manly Thomas was and then switching around and joking about how coked out uh, Taniel was. Kresimir's promise is the big problem for me. And I know you you did a good job of describing why the historical, like tactical decisions started to add up for you. And I think that's along the same line of the book wants to be a kind of military thriller and the military decisions aren't consistent with what we know about militaries. Right. Personally, I view that as a more minor problem, but... I do see how it adds up. Well, here's here's another one that 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 might hit you. Uh, you know how businesses love unions and like it makes businesses more efficient. And they just like when you hear about a a business that's being threatened with unionization, they're like, hell yeah, bring it on, give me the unions, and like not threatening to just lay off all the workers. I have hesitated. I've mentioned in a couple of reviews that I think I even mentioned in the description of the podcast we just put out. That's one of the most unbelievable. That's one of the most fantastical elements of this world is that the capitalists just love how productive the unions are. And I'm careful about that because I think unions do good work. At the same time, I've known a lot of manager types, white collar types, who worked in union environments and have very different opinions about the productivity of the union. Well, regardless the the fact that the businesses are welcoming the unions it's like no they're not <laughs> i got the vibe <laughs> the businesses will come in and say if you try to unionize you're all out of jobs well i kind of got the vibe that brian mcclellan was maybe trying to make a statement about his own socioeconomic beliefs i think maybe brian mcclellan thinks there's an argument to be made that Unions make things more productive and therefore a smart business owner would welcome a union. I think maybe that was just him bleeding a little of his own idealism into the book. I'm willing to forgive it, but that's one of the things I joke about. The main reason I bring it up in my review is because I wanted to talk about a commitment to historical accuracy because I, I foresee that as a defense for the Taniel Capoel relationship is that back in the long, long ago, it wasn't unusual for a young girl to marry an older man. And in this case, we're talking like old enough to be your father kind of thing. Yeah, that's true. And you know, rules of society change. But one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the union thing was because if we're committed to historical accuracy and things like romantic relationships, it would be weird then to insert your own personal socioeconomic philosophy from the 21st century into that world <laughs> and not bring in any of your own uh, 21st century notions of permissible relationships. But I digress. I just wanted to get that on the record because I, I feel like that's a correction from the first episode. I joke about certain things and I am not joking about others and I did not make that clear enough. So I hope I've made that clear enough. Let's talk about some of what happens in what I am calling part two. <laughs> so now that, now that we've introduced the council, I know you've probably forgotten who they are. That's fine. I forgot who they are too and I had to reread them uh, a few times before I caught on. But they had a secret meeting place that only they knew about inside the Tower of Nobles. And Thomas is down there planning out his war 
when a warden from Kez just shows up. I, I, okay, so wardens are, like, gigantic people. Like, they're humongous monstrosities. And I guess I shouldn't complain about, like, how did you conceal this guy? Fine, fine, fine. But my thing about the wardens is they suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're Worf from Star Trek, where it's like, we're trying to imply that they're good, but they just constantly get the shit kicked out of them. The wardens are constantly being just mowed down like common soldiers. And Thomas, with the help of his dog and a cigar that <laughs> has some gunpowder in it, defeats the warden pretty pretty easily. I might... I, I do think the wardens are a little bit like the mage breaker in that we're told they're really good at do like you said we're told they're really good at doing a thing and then they're they're not so good at doing a thing um <laughs> right but i i do think the the warden does a good job of kicking the shit out of thomas it would have been better writing to show the wardens really doing some damage before we showed them being defeated because i think the wardens are supposed to demonstrate that thomas and Taniel, who keep taking wardens out right and left are exceptional fighters. Instead, it just makes the warden seem really easy to kill. Like Worf. Yeah. <laughs> your, your analogy is perfect. Yeah, I was also going to say, or like Clarence Townsend from our writing, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah he's, he's completely useless. He always gets the crap kicked out he of him. He always gets a car thrown at him. <laughs> yeah. He always gets run over by a car. But he's very threatening. <laughs> He'll kick your ass as long as there's not a car nearby. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right, and I think that's another great thing to bring up is the the writing I think that bothers you the most is the writing that reminds you of yourself. Yes. <laughs> and that is very much an Edenverse trope that, that we we recognized in our own writing pretty early on, and it just turned into a joke. <laughs> our main baddie was just getting bodied right and left because much <laughs> like I suspect Brian McClellan, we didn't want to have any of our main cast get into any real trouble at that point in the story. Like he's still on book one of what I, what he knew was going to be a trilogy. So he didn't want, like, obviously uh, Thomas can't die halfway through the first book and Daniel can't die halfway through the first book. So right. we got to sacrifice one of the dogs. Like I guess a dog is a good, <laughs> a good <laughs> substitute because we technically do care about the dogs. The dogs did get a little bit of development and who doesn't like a dog. And so when this warden, you know, breaks a dog's back, we're like, oh, I don't like him. <laughs> and, and because this warden attacked him, Thomas knows there's a traitor in his midst, but he seems to believe only one, I... which you brought up. And I went, you know what? That is true. Why did he assume there was only one traitor? I assumed, and this is me being a little, maybe overestimating what the book was going for here. <laughs> I was still hung up on the scene at the pier where Thomas just took it upon himself to start a war because he was personally insulted. And I figured, oh, the council decided to get rid of him. And then when Thomas was right. like, there is one of you is a traitor. I was like, oh, we're not doing that. That's uh, it's just one of them. He knew that for some reason. And I'll point out now that this is like, I can, uh, okay, I can, I can understand this. This is another one of the, like, I, I can buy that these people have this relationship with him. I just think it would have been more interesting if there were more consequences for Thomas's political decisions. But no, there is exactly one traitor, and that's how we get Adamat back into this book. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to really mention Adamat again for a while, but basically Thomas says, Hey, detective, I need you to figure out who the traitor is. And Adamant spends most of the rest of the book interviewing every single member of the council. It serves as a double get Adamant back in the book. Because I'm guessing Adamant is also going to do something important later. And try and characterize these guys. Yeah, and get some character development for this council. Because I'm guessing these guys are also going to be important later on. Yeah, that's his entire plot line for a while. Uh, Lord v Vetus, Vetus, Velveeta, he'll eventually give... Adamat, his son's uh, ring finger, and Adamat will spill the beans and betray Thomas to Lord Vetus, Vetus, 
Venus, and we'll, we'll, we'll catch back with Adam at later, but he's just wandering around talking with people, basically. Oh, and then there's a... The, after this chapter, there's a funny slapstick chapter with Olam and Thomas where they learn that Mihaly the cook can summon food. I do I I do want to briefly elaborate on that and is, and that is that like Mihaly we didn't mention him much in the first episode. He just sort of gets that cameo in the in the tent. But Mihaly is is the greatest chef in the world, the reincarnation of the great god Adam, and he is a delight. I really liked every scene with Mihaly. I I think the comedy of Mihaly works that he's this quirky dude who just does magic via cooking like he always cooks yeah, up just the right has thing a lot of good character he can cook up a thing that heals you he can cook up a thing i liked it because it was this is the kind of magic i like actually i don't fully understand what he's doing and it's kind of subtle and i like it it is mentioned that it breaks all the rules they don't believe that he is a uh, god reincarnated they believe that he's just some exceptionally talented knacked whose knack is he can create organic matter and cook it. <laughs> no big deal. He puts a loaf of bread in the oven and he gets 20 loaves of bread out of it. No big deal. But I do like that kind of sleight of hand magic. As uh, Yeah, as you're talking about it, maybe that was part of my problem. I can get behind a hard magic system, but it can't run in parallel with a non-hard magic system. Like... <laughs> you can't have a hard magic system and then have Harry Potter magic. Well, I don't want to judge him too harsh on that because part of, one of the things I am I interested in is how <laughs> the gods relate to the privileged and, and the rest of the um, uh, Yeah, I, I'm hierarchy. sure this could be explained in future books. You're right. I do get the vibe he is going to do something with it. I, and so I do like it. But w- the other thing I like about Mihaly is that he seems to be the patron saint of Adapest, the town we're in and, or the kingdom we're in and he doesn't want to see them destroyed by Cresimere. And so he's exerting his subtle influences to steer them in the right direction. I like it. He's kind of a Gandalf figure almost like he's, he's directing the party towards the correct solution, but he's not telling them what to do. He's just feeding the troops and making sure that morale stays up and keep, keeping the army together, keeping the defenses going. And I like that. I like everything about that. If this book had a little bit more Mihaly, I'd like it <laughs> more, I guess. I, I was going to say something harsher, but I do think I would read another book in this series. I, I don't hate it. Well, I'm sure you'd want more Mihaly and less of Taniel, which is where I wanted to go next. Yes. Huh. So Taniel is ordered by his dad to go kill Bo, Taniel's friend, because Bo is a privileged, and he's going to have to avenge uh, the king's death and eventually try and kill Thomas. So Taniel goes with Poe and Juline, where Juline uh, straight up tells him, uh, I don't trust you, which is some Iglar Tiger's Blood level shit. No, I'm not going to explain that reference. Uh, so <laughs> Taniel's like, I'm going to do it myself. So he follows... Sorry, are you going to say something? What do you feel about the, the characterization of Thomas? Because I think we've got an interesting dichotomy here between... So... We're obviously supposed to like him. Yeah, he keeps saying things like, I want to give the money back to the people. I want to feed the people. And I honestly thought the book, that a lot of it was going to be like trying to get everything he wants and finding out that it's just not plausible and having to make a bunch of compromises and ultimately where he started is not where he ended up because a lot of times in history people are like i want to give back to the people and then they're just a horrible douchebag dictator and things are worse um yeah it's the old or at the very least not better why doesn't anybody ever just be a good king how hard could that be yeah yeah, it, it should be easy for you to just give food to the people. Yeah, nobody has to grow and not that. not tax them. Nobody owns the <laughs> land that that food's grown on. They're not going to be mad. It, Yeah, it, it, it would have been an interesting thing, and I, I think that's where I thought the book was going, too. It was going to be a little more hard-hitting politically, but... Yes, I thought this would have a lot more with the political side of things. They wanted to focus on the magic instead. Yeah. So the political stuff is just kind of there to keep the plot moving. It's bare. It's really bare bones. But 
The the other thing I wanted to point out was it's a little clumsy the way Thomas is handled, I think, because we get the scene with the warden where Thomas is super concerned about his puppies and again, <laughs> a dog. This is this is like a horror movie thing for me. This is this is a trope from all my horror stuff. Easiest way to get sympathy for something is to put a dog in it. If somebody likes dogs, well, they can't are they really pure evil? They still like dogs. And then if somebody kills a dog, yeah, they're pure evil. Because who would kill a dog? And so Thomas has these dogs that he cares for immensely. And we see him, you know, get a surgeon in to try to fix the dog. And eventually the dog can't be fixed. And he puts the dog down himself because he cared that much. And he didn't want him to suffer. And then very next scene... He's asking his son to kill his adopted brother, who is also his best friend. <laughs> Not just asking, ordering. His son ordering. says, no, I won't do it if you ask me. I will only do it if you order me as my, as my commanding officer. And he goes, I order you to do it. And at that point, I was thinking to myself, like, I don't like Daniel, but I know why he screwed up. Obviously, yeah. he screwed up because Thomas is a sociopath and the whole reason we're doing this the whole reason you got to kill your stepbrother is because your stepbrother is magically bound to kill me just because i committed a little regicide (laughs) (laughs) can you believe that (laughs) it's like it's like yeah you know what thomas most parents (laughs) most parents would die for their children not kill them I don't know. It, it doesn't endear Thomas to me. The, the the puppy isn't enough to save Thomas for me either. And this, the reason I mention this is because it is going to become a problem for me a little later on in this chapter because, or not this chapter, but this part, because we kind of have an all is lost moment where things are looking yeah. really bad for Thomas and, and he's Daniel. He's feeling real sad about him, his life. And I was just like, uh-huh. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> well, you're a terrible garbage person. So Yeah. <laughs> You're kind of you're kind of getting you're kind of sleeping in the bed you made there, Thomas and Daniel to a lesser extent. I I don't I don't like them, and that's another complaint I tend to shy away from. It's fine to not like a character. Just because you don't like a character doesn't mean it's a poorly written character. But in this case, it's about intent. It's a little bit of a problem because I'm supposed to feel a lot of sympathy for the characters and I'm supposed to be worried for the characters, but I'm not because if Thomas died, he'd just be a victim of his own hubris. Like if this were a Shakespeare play, Thomas would die. Thomas is, you know, Macbeth. The rest of the play is just him dealing with the consequences of his sin. But this isn't a Shakespeare play. This is a Brian McClellan fantasy novel about gun mages. So it's okay. Like he seems to want to have Thomas be a complicated figure, but he also doesn't want to commit to Thomas being a complicated figure. Right. I think we're supposed to still be rooting for Thomas because he does all these good things, but he also does all these horrible things. I don't hate it. I see what he's going for. I think it could have been smoothed out a little bit. I think it's just a little too jerky. It's a little too like good guy, bad guy, good guy, bad guy. Each chapter alternates. And we kind of needed to smooth him out and, and make him have a little bit more of a an inner conflict about his actions. I would have liked to see that. Yeah, and then he would have to interact more with his son, who they clearly have a weird relationship. They don't have a lot of interaction. They have like two or maybe three scenes together. Yeah, I'm hoping that changes. Yeah, it could certainly change. I mean, there's like 19 of these books or something, so certainly possible. So yeah, what were we, ta- we were talking about Taniel. So Taniel goes, uh, he meets a guy named Gavril, who apparently will be important later. Gavril's like the Watchmaster up, uh, up on the yeah, mountain. He's the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and and he takes Taniel to go where Bo is, which is further up on the mountain, near Cressum Kurga, which is a city of the gods made in a mountain crater. And Taniel finds he can't kill Bo, and just as he's about to go over to Bo, a monstrous lion jumps after Bo, 
and is shooting magic. And then K- Capel? Poe? I-, I wrote down Poe. Capoel? Capoel. <laughs> she, she followed them up, even though Daniel told him not to. And uh, she uses magic with, like, dolls? She uses voodoo dolls. She's the only one that has any effect. Because the, the lion's yes. shrugging off yes, magic. Yes, the only one that has any effect on the lion. And the lion turns out to be Juline. And Juline is thrown off the mountain. Juline was a were lion the whole time. And they all reunite. <laughs> yes. And so they realize that Juline is trying to get to the summit so that she can summon Kreshemir and become like a queen or a god queen or whatever. And so they got to stop her from getting back up the mountain. And the only way she's going to get back up the mountain is with the Kez army, which is here. It's on its way, Ben. In defense of the book, it didn't occur to me until I just heard you retell it. But she needs the Kez army to get back up because at this point she's been found out. Uh, Taniel knows she's a traitor and she knows Kapoel is enough to challenge her. So she goes back to, to come back with an army. But also... And and she needs all that extra Yeah, magic. that was the thing. That's so, true. like, what did she think she was going to do this first time? She needed... It's pointed out she needs all these sorcerers. Oh, that's a good point. She needs all these sorcerers to sacrifice, and... Was she just going to kill Bo? Was that her plan? I don't plan? know. I don't know that... I guess she was going to kill Bo and maybe come back later. I guess we could say that. It's not, it's not story-breaking, but it is in... I guess kill Bo, and then there won't be any mages to throw up shield wards and it will be easy to take out the, the bastion that's true it's very true i guess i guess that's probably what it is i i didn't actually take issue with that i didn't even think about that until no i don't think up. it's a big deal but i guess that could be what her plan yeah, was I, yeah I, I don't think that's a that's a stick the, the other weird thing and i this isn't really a complaint this is just like why was she a lion I've read the entire. That's her preferred. I've form. read the entire book, and I still don't understand why she's a lion. Is she a lion that turns into a woman, or a woman that turns into a lion? I don't know. Without knowing more about the predi, I, I, I don't and there's know. also all these cave lions. There's cave lions all over the mountain, and they're solitary. That one that does not make sense to me. And that comes up towards the end. I did not understand their purpose. I, my guess is that cave lions are some kind of magical creature. I guess that's probably explored more in future books. I thought it was like maybe the lions were protecting the city? Yeah, well, they definitely had some kind of purpose because Juline can command them and she obviously identifies with them. So, uh... Does she command them? They hunt her own... They hunt her group. Yeah, I don't know. Well, then why were... Yeah, I guess maybe they were just called to the city because people were in the city. This is part three territory. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, because they were hunting the Kez. Okay. You, we'll, we'll save this for part three because you were wondering if this was going to be a three-parter. Yeah. I could tell you, I don't know how this is going to come out in editing, but we're, yep. we're 50 minutes into the episode and we're not even close to halfway through this script. Oh, I, I just planned for three parts. As if you scroll down, I, I have part three down here. Yeah, so Taniel and Bo, they, they go back down the mountain with Gavril and they... They realize the Kez army is there. Juline is with them. They've got to make their preparations. And the one thing that really bothered me and really pulled me out of the book again is they're down in the battlements. I picture it as like a pillbox, but it's probably not that. And there are Kez sappers digging into the mountain, presumably to like blow up the wall from underground and cause a breach. And they are within shooting distance of the... Uh, the Watchmen, their army, and they don't shoot the sappers. And someone's like, why didn't you shoot the sappers? And he's like, I wasn't ordered to. And it's like, that's a standing order. That's a rule of war. These guys are trying to kill you. They're trying to break open your defenses and let their army in to murder you. And... You're just watching them yeah, do oh, it. Yeah. Shoot I them. promise you, I, I live near a Navy base. And uh, if if you walk on, if you accidentally, it's very easy to accidentally turn on to the Navy base. You are, you are not getting out of there anytime soon. If you accidentally drive in there, you will be stopped. Yeah. Your car will be searched. <laughs> and they do not need to ask uh, anyone for permission. They just know to do that. That's actually why they, they yeah. have watchmen. 
you know? I don't know what you thought your job was, yeah. but it was not to watch them <laughs> do it. I think you might have misunderstood. You took your position literally. Yes. You were to you were to watch and prevent the the base from being blown yes. up. <laughs> like I could see somebody not shooting if it was like one guy coming up to parlay or something. But yeah, if you're actually if you're actively watching the army. An army dig into the side of the mountain with explosives, <laughs> you could probably assume that your supervisor would want you to take the shot. But the whole reason they didn't yeah. was because Brian McClellan had a cool idea for a scene where the guy's like, I don't know what to do in this situation. And the guy takes the gun from him, blows the sapper uh, away and, and goes, that's what you do, son. Take your rifle. Everybody start shooting. And then we get a dramatic introduction. It's, it's more cinematic <laughs> as books should be, as we know from <laughs> Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. Dune was so much better once they oh. made it more cinematic. That's sick burn all right so we'll go back to thomas and olin for a while because taniel's taniel's doing every that time thing. you say thomas i i fill in tank engine <laughs> thomas the tank engine and uh havoc from full metal alchemist <laughs> they're busy hiring some assassins to grab a suspected kez spy and torture information out momo's of gonna him. have a, a much easier time animating this one <laughs> yeah. just, just photoshop some shit in there momo <laughs> <laughs> so just keep that in mind okay they grab this kez spy and they learn that there's a ton of other kez spies tons of them hundreds of them in the city possibly more just keep that in mind oh man i wrote this down i don't know i i kind of wanted to stick with thomas but adamant's terrible investigation uh there's a guy who's kind of uh being a dick and i think that you know maybe that guy is the bad guy one eternity later all right so I just I'm just gonna stick with Thomas. So yeah, they figured out there's a ton of traitors. Um, and wow. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm looking like God. This is scattered all. There's over a lot the of place. traitors and just. Okay. Oh wow, wow man. There's a lot. Of, I don't know. <laughs> Turns out being king's a lot harder than I thought. The privileged man. are are really magnetic to the opposite sex and they're extra oh, horny, God. so they need a harem. <laughs> Put a pin in that. I'm trying to, and and the and the fact that Kez just lost a war to a colony, but now they're starting a war with a more industrialized nation. Uh, but I, I guess that can make sense because maybe they didn't think they'd win the war; they just wanted to summon the god. Yeah, I think that was their whole plan. Okay, I'm scrolling all the way down here. <laughs> so we already talked about how Thomas's wife was a spy and deserved what she got, right? I. I <laughs> I don't want to say so, she deserved what she got, but at the very least, I think it just falls under she was a casualty of war, of which there have been many, and I'm sure Thomas is responsible for more than a few dead dead men and women who didn't deserve to die, and he's certainly about to be responsible right. for many, many, many more, and that never bothered him, right. so it's very hypocritical that he can start a war over his wife who was killed as a result of this conflict, this ongoing conflict. So I, I don't know. I, I, I find that tacky. Not unbelievable, but tacky. Yeah, he probably had a lot of husbands and wives and sons and daughters get killed for his stupid wife. <laughs> stupid wife. <laughs> Do you want to talk about what his wife was doing, actually? She was smuggling powder mages out of Kez. Be smuggling powder mages out of Kez so that Thomas could then recruit them into his army. Well, and she was found out, and she and her parents were executed for it, because her parents are native Kez nobles. Not just that. There's a little bit more to it, in that, yes, Thomas wanted to recruit them, but also there's a slightly nobler thing where marked, who become powder mages, are um, a, a persecuted class in Kez. They're hunted down and their power is stripped from them through like a forced surgical procedure. It's not it's not fun to be a marked in the in the Kez kingdom. Yeah, and she lost her head over it. So I, I skipped way ahead. So Thomas found out he had all these spies, right? And then here's a scene I really hated. They decide to go on the annual 
St. Adam's Day Festival hunt in the Kingswood with all the councilmen and all these spies just littering. I really thought you were going to say with all the king's horses and all the king's men. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like I, I as soon as I saw, oh, I hate this hunt. I don't I wish we didn't have to do this, but I guess I will. I was like, well, this is obviously leading to a trap, and what do you know? It did. First, they are led by a guide into an ambush by Brigadier Rise. Or whatever, I think that's his name. Brigadier Rise. But turns out Rise was only pretending to betray Thomas, and he's being. His son is being held by Brigadier Barat, that guy who is giving Adamat problems. And they're. The guide also betrayed. There's a lot of betrayals, okay? A bunch of people betray each other, and eventually uh, Thomas gets captured by that guy he threw into the river who also uh, executed Thomas's wife. <laughs> You're a ma- master is that, summary. Is that, is that adequate? Yeah, that's fine. Tom- <laughs> yeah. Thomas is double-crossed. Put, put some music under that. Thomas is know? double-crossed. He gets... He's double... Triple-crossed. Tr- he's double-crossed. His double-crosser is double-crossed. There's, there's, there's several crosses yes. here. And then you didn't realize at first this is the lowest point, where Thomas is captured by the man who executed his wife, and his leg is repaired following the attack, and they put some gold in there so he can no longer use his powder mage powers... Uh, the Kez are about to storm the fort on the mountain and overrun Taniel and kill everyone up there. And Adamant was delivered that finger by Lord Vettis, and he's morally compromised into revealing all the secrets of his investigation. Yeah, it, it took me a minute to be like, so like it was. It wasn't until the next chapter after Thomas got his powers taken away that I was like, oh, a lot of bad stuff's happening to people I'm not supposed to hate. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this is this is the the act two part where all is lost okay. like i get i i well they resolve those pretty quickly they do but the thing that that got me was like there is a god right that is gonna come back and destroy this kingdom because of what thomas did so yes. like thomas dying right now and them putting the king back on the throne kind of solves all the problems so yeah. <laughs> that's why i was i was having a hard time seeing the all is lost moment because like we started after the rebellion was already over we didn't get to see how terrible of a king Manhooch was and we already know that thomas is mostly doing this out of a personal grudge against the kez because they killed his wife so as somebody on the side of the common man, I personally didn't feel Thomas's cause was just until Mihali told me it was just. Once Mihali told me <laughs> it was good, and that was that was towards the very end. He is end. my moral compass in this book. I like Mihali. I'm not fully committed yet to Thomas's rule. I first off, I don't think he's a very good ruler, and I don't kind of want him to be in charge i would like to see like a republic or uh, some kind of democratic government instituted right now they're under martial law and uh, i think that that was his plan question yeah he's mark. getting there he's taking a sweet time getting there uh he's doing a lot of like yeah the council is supposed to vote on all these decisions but oh yeah they're all military decisions so they're all mine i guess so uh, yeah i i don't know i didn't really see I'm not really sure what we're fighting for here. I, I guess if I was an average soldier in this war, I'd be like, yeah, Manhooch sucked, but Manhooch is dead now. And I don't know if, if a God's going to shoot a volcano at us, maybe, uh, maybe we put that little kid on the throne. I don't know if I really want to fight God this weekend. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a good point. And then when Mihaly is like, it doesn't really matter what you do now, he's going to try to, like, Kresimir is going to try to kill you. That Then I was like, oh, okay, so yeah, they got to finish this. Thomas has to finish what he started. I, I needed that point before this point for me to feel really, like, worried right now. Right, and because they resolve the lowest point pretty quickly. Uh, Taniel repels the attack, 
Adamat is Adamant and is unimportant, so who cares? And Thomas is rescued because his dog was bred to be able to find him at any distance, and he is easily rescued after spending a few chapters feeling down on himself. Okay, dude, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I actually like have a highlight in my book <laughs> on the point where they're like, we secretly trained this dog to find you and we didn't tell you because we needed we wanted it to be a deus ex machina here's the problem it's a writing problem and it is a problem the dog finding him was fine because the dog spends every waking moment with him and is super attached to him and we've established that throughout the book and at the beginning of the hunt thomas has entered his dog in the hunt the hunt is actually a competition for the dogs to catch this fox or something and his dog is is going to do really well in the hunt because his dog is a master tracker. And when his dog finds him, that came as no surprise to me because the dog is dedicated to him and is a master tracker. In fact, even just the dog being dedicated to him would be enough because there's a thousand Disney movies and shit about dogs finding people across the country. That's a thing dogs can do. <laughs> It, you know, it, it's wonderful and heartwarming. It didn't need to be a deus ex machina. <laughs> a deus ex, a deus ex machina no. is a lazy technique no. 99% of the time. Especially when it's supposed to be hard magic where, like, your options are grounded in the rules of the world. You you need to establish shit like this before you pull My the trigger. My thing was, he had done, Brian McClellan had done the hard work of establishing this. And yes. then he undid. But then he established a he different thing. He undid his own <laughs> yeah. hard work and undermined it by adding this. And I kind of wondered to myself, like, was there like a beta reader or an editor out there who was like, I don't know. I don't really find the dog finding him to be all that believable. You need to clarify why that was possible. If that was feedback he got, if that initially wasn't in there, I'd be like, dude. Tell that beta reader to kiss rocks, man. <laughs> kiss rocks. That's an expression that I may have just invented. <laughs> I don't know. I think kick rocks. <laughs> kick rocks is maybe the thing you're supposed to do. I like kiss rocks better. It sounds like you're going to curb stomp them. <laughs> or attend a rock concert. But I'm... <sighs> I want to let, let's end part two with uh, going to my wheelhouse. Now that we've resolved that act two drama. Um, oh yes. I did want to talk to you about this as a medical professional, because I, I, I have thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I'll okay, let you set so it up. <laughs> we all know. I, I don't know if we established this or not, actually that if a privileged who, who is like the generic sorcerer of the world, if a privileged comes in contact with gunpowder, they're allergic to it and it makes them sick. And if a powder mage comes in contact with gold, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with privileged, uh, that renders their, if they get gold in their bloodstream, that renders them powerless, unable to access the else. And so to ensure that Thomas would not be able to escape, they surgically insert a gold star into his leg near his leg bone. And um, Thomas obviously wants to get that removed once he is rescued. And so he's talking to his surgeon and his surgeon's like, no, I won't do it. You could lose the leg. This is, this is a terrible idea. And uh, Thomas is like, I don't care. Like like six of one, half a dozen of the other. I'm kind of magically crippled right now. So if I lost the leg but got my powers back, that, that's kind of a win for old Thomas. And uh, eventually the surgeon's <laughs> like, well, no, we don't need to do it because eventually it'll, uh, you know, scar over, form a cyst or get absorbed into the bone or something. And... Then yeah, he said it would form a cyst around yeah, it and be cut off from the. It'll bloodstream. be cut off from the bloodstream then. But then Thomas says, and this is where I wanted to talk to you. I don't know if the cyst thing is true, but I especially didn't know if this was true. That 
it won't form a cyst or, or if it tries to form a cyst, it'll just keep breaking open because it's shaped like a star. <laughs> oh, I just, I thought this was so stupid that I went and I told my mom, who is also a medical professional, and she looked at me like I was a big dumb idiot. And I, I was like, yeah, that's in my book. And she's like, what? Yeah, that's, that is not at all how the human body and also star-shaped foreign material works. The first thing I want to ask you is if somebody just put some gold, how, how would somebody have to put gold in your leg to get it to stay? <laughs> I, you know, I figured that they, they just like shoved it in some muscle tissue or in a in bone or something. Well, like his leg was broken, so they could have conceivably like put it in the cracked bone and let it heal back together. So let's say that that's how they did it. They they somehow put it like attached a spur of the star into the bone. So then what would happen? What would grow over that? So it's a foreign body and your body would probably have potentially have an Im- immune response to it and want to expel it or it would just be like a gross nasty granuloma that's like just a pus filled gross sack of crap but it wouldn't constantly break open over and over again because it's shaped like a star yeah i mean i knew by like i'm not a medical professional but i am someone who has lived in the world long enough to know what happens when a sticky substance sticks to another substance and eventually it's just going to cover the whole thing like points and all and and it's not gonna yes (laughs) that's that's the part that got me where they're like, eventually it will form a cyst. It's like, I mean, maybe, but... Like, if you just rolled a star-shaped thing in a bunch of mud, it's not going to keep breaking open the mud. Eventually, that's <laughs> just going to dry into, like, a mud ball with a star inside it. It's like how dinosaur right. fossils, because, like, right. the dinosaur fossils are pointy, how they always keep breaking out of the dirt. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's yeah. how we found them all. Yeah, they're, like, they're just sticking out all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that was the part that got me. I was like, wait a minute, you're saying... It's star-shaped, so it's never going to heal. Here's what Thomas had to tell his doctor. I don't care if you have to amputate the leg. Just get me my superpowers back. And you'll do it because I'm the new king. (laughs) Because that's the role I'm fulfilling right now. (laughs) Right. You will do it or I'll kill you. Like, all, that's all Thomas had to do. He didn't have to have this weird conversation about the nature of star-shaped things. <laughs> yeah. in, my, in my professional medical opinion, star-shaped things are, are the worst thing in nature because they're sharp and they'll constantly hurt you forever. Sometimes they leave a bullet inside you. Like, sometimes it's just easier. Or it's, or it's too dangerous to operate. Like, if a bullet's too close to your spine or something. Yeah, pull, pulling it out would just damage more tissue. And that bullet does not continue to just do damage and float around in your body, killing you. Yes, yeah, so uh, Thomas gets his powers back. Taniel pretty effortlessly repels the Kez. And no... Yeah, it, they, the, the Kez charges them, and then they, they just keep shooting at them. And eventually, the Kez have been shot too much to and continue Taniel charging. And Taniel is doing so well at holding off the Kez that... Thomas is going on a little little fox hunt and not sending reinforcements. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel's like, oh shit, we're we're about to be overrun. We need help. Send this letter to my dad. And his dad is like, I'd like to fox help, hunting. but like, we gotta get yeah. this fox first. He sends a letter that says, God is coming back to specifically kill you. He's really pissed at you. <laughs> and he's going to kill all of us because of you. And also, there's an army invading. And also, Julian, also Julian, your ex-girlfriend is a were lion. <laughs> and she is going to summon God, and then God will kill you. Dad, there is crap like I have never seen going on out here. <laughs> For the love of God, send everything. <laughs> and Thomas is like, oh, I wish my other dog could be here for this fox hunt. That other dog was like the son I never had. 
including both my son and my adopted son and my adopted daughter who I tried to marry to my son. <laughs> Unfortunately, my son was more interested in his weird child bride. <laughs> It doesn't happen in this book, but I can't wait till Thomas finds out about that one. <laughs> you know, you know what I almost think will happen. You know what I think will happen. He'll find out at a at a moment where his son and himself are both like vulnerable and Thomas is like, "I finally accept you, son. You you go with your weird child bride." And then he dies. No, you know what I think is going to happen is Thomas is going to wildly speculate on the possibility of what would happen if you mixed the genetic material of a bone eye with a marked. And he's going to be like, you know what? I approve this experiment. Yeah. I'm okay with this. Why don't you have three kids just so we have like, you know, a boy, a girl and a control. <laughs> Hey, he didn't have. He doesn't have to marry Vlora. He just has to uh, put a baby in her. You know, you're making good points. <laughs> you're making good points because no, you're making good oh, points because any- that's they mentioned that with the privileged, like that was the reason one of the privileged men had a harem was he was trying to knock up as many women as possible to create more privileged, but it didn't work because like there's not a genetic relationship between privileged powers but there is a genetic relationship with marked powers so oh yeah that could there's a lot of weird sex shit in these books if i haven't been absolutely 100 percent clear about that <laughs> i think i'm ready to wrap up this part though uh yes yeah, so let's wrap it up let's let's do the uh let's do the, the plugs and the things all right so buy us a coffee the- go on twitter Look at our website. All right. And you can do that by visiting <laughs> buymeacoffee.com slash WABpod, Twitter at WABpod, and blog.wordsaboutbooks.ninja. I have put up my Goodreads reviews on blogs.wordsaboutbooks.ninja. Nate hasn't because Nate thinks I'm going to do all his blogs for him. But you know what? He's got another thing coming. Yeah, I'll get around to it. Okay, bye. Later. Next time on Words About Books. But this is the gold star that is embedded in the book (laughs) that just won't heal over because it keeps cutting open the wound. Thomas decides not to do that. Tells tells the Archdiocese to go kiss rocks. (laughs) Go kiss rocks.